it working? Okay. May I ask kindly the other member of this panel to take their seat? Thanks. Uh, Christopher, I think it's still. Please. I don't have a watch. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, if I take a watch to control the time. Sorry. Oh. Yes. Okay, so first of all, uh, my personal excuses for starting with 10 minutes delay, but uh, uh, the discussion on the, the last uh, amendments on the statement uh, was uh, intense, and so uh, it took more time than uh, expected. Um, so, uh, uh, welcome, welcome again to, to all of you. And uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Erminia Shakitano. I'm uh, working at the uh, European Commission, uh, DG Education and Culture. And uh, I'm, uh, in my task is to work at the development of heritage policies and uh, economy of culture. And I am a seconded national expert uh, from the Italian Ministry of Culture. So uh, I'm an architect, I'm trained in, in uh, heritage preservation. This is my background, the background of a technician in the sense. And uh, so, first of all, I would like to, to thank the Latvian presidency for having proposed this team and organized this conference and for marking another important step in the development of heritage policies at European level. And I would like to start uh, with uh, five minutes of, uh, uh, of the scenario of where we are now in the development of heritage policy at uh, European level. Uh, so really to focus on what can be our contribution as, as uh, the contribution of the conference, with rich conference. Uh, as you know, I, I imagine that you know that in uh, 2014, uh, 2014 can be considered a turning point in Europe on, uh, uh, on, uh, on towards the wide recognition of the importance of heritage at the level of heritage policies. Uh, because uh, despite heritage, it is really in the heart of the competence of the uh, Ministry of Culture. What happened is that for a long time we haven't had any uh, official document or council conclusion that was focusing on cultural heritage. We have to go back to 1993 to find a resolution of the Council uh, of Ministers. Uh, the heritage, it was mentioned, we can say, it was mentioned in two important council conclusions, focusing on uh, the role of architectural uh, uh, quality in urban and rural envir environment, and uh, um, when uh, dealing also in 2008 with the contribution of architecture to sustainable development. Uh, why this, why this happened? Because uh, traditionally heritage, it is considered a competence of member states and uh, it's primarily responsibility of member states and regional and local authorities, uh, of course, in uh, respect to do their uh, national repartition of competences. Um, the turning point was 2009 when uh, the Lisbon Treaty added to, um, to important uh, novelties in the treaty. The first novelty is Article 3.3, uh, because now the treaty says that uh, uh, requires that the EU has to ensure that Europe's cultural heritage is safeguarded and enhanced. This was a very important innovation in the treaty. And Article 167. Uh, of the Treaty of Functioning of European Union uh, um, says that the Union shall contribute to the flowering of the cultures of member states 
while respecting their national and regional diversity, at the same time bringing calmer cultural heritage to the fore. And the European Union is invited to encourage cooperation between member states and, if necessary, to support and supplement their action with regard to the safeguarding of cultural heritage of European significance. I stress the importance, this, this importance of the European significance. Of course, any harmonization of the laws and uh, regulations of member states, it is excluded. Uh, but at the same time, there is an emerging need uh, uh, of, uh, uh, for more cooperation because member states are facing uh, all the same problems. Uh, and all the member states are aware that the current reduction in public budget for culture are diminishing uh, uh, their capacity to protect and preserve their cultural heritage, to make it accessible, and uh, also to ensure sometimes the day-to-day -day running of museums and heritage sites. Uh, as a consequence, in 2010, things started to move faster, and we started with the Belgian uh, presidency, who launched an initiative uh, to set up a platform for cooperation among member states to raise awareness on cultural heritage at EU level. And uh, the key was to look at cultural heritage not only in the domain of the cultural sphere, but to look at all the dimension of cultural heritage which are, which are contained in the sectorial policies of the EU, which is a broader spectrum. And uh, this fruitful cooperation, uh, it was uh, continued during several presidencies. And we had a very important contribution from the Lithuanian presidency, then the Greek presidency, uh, then the Italian, and now very happy to see that the Latvian presidency continued to, 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 to work in, toward this direction. As a result, in 2014, we had uh, um, a number of documents on cultural heritage that is astonishing if compared with the previous situation. Uh, in May 2014, we have the Council conclusion adopted under the Greek presidencies, uh, presidency on cultural heritage as a strategic resource for, for a sustainable Europe. And the conclusion called for mainstreaming cultural heritage in national and European policies and to the development of a strategic approach to cultural heritage. It's a very important mandate from the Council conclusion. Responding to this call in July, the Commission adopted a communication uh, towards an integrated, integrated approach to cultural heritage for Europe, Europe and where we really tried to highlight what could be this uh, strategic, new strategic approach. Then in November 2014, under the Italian presidency, uh, the cultural minister adopted another council conclusion on the participatory governance of cultural heritage and also included cultural heritage among the four priorities of the new work plan for culture, which is the principal framework for uh, um, European cooperation in the field of culture. In the Council conclusion on, on participatory governance of cultural heritage, it was also included an important proposal for uh, working towards an European year of cultural heritage. So we also have a, an important horizon in front of us. Uh, we can see that today it's an important momentum for policy development uh, for cultural heritage. It's more clear that now there is no contradiction between national responsibility and EU intervention. We can work together. Uh, also making a full use of the potential of, of cultural heritage and also of the programs and the opportunities that the EU uh, offers to, to member states. So, uh, with the Latvian um, presidency now, we, have, uh, we are making another important progress, another important step, looking at the interaction between heritage, contemporary architecture and design. Uh, we had very two intense days uh, of uh, discussion and, uh, and uh, information on many important initiatives. Uh, so, a lot of food, of, food for thought. Was, was served. As I'm an Italian, I can say that the food for thought was well prepared, elegantly served, and, uh, and uh, also tasteful. 
Uh, we started from the appetizer at the, yesterday with this uh, interesting uh, visit, which raised uh, the first discussion among us uh, on the values of historical environment, on its preservation, development processes, and also it was interesting to see in Riga that all many different approaches that we have in Europe uh, to the historical environment, as, as uh, Christopher Young uh, highlighted yesterday. Uh, we also have side dishes with these two in important, interesting expositions, exposition on architecture and exposition on design uh, downstairs. Uh, so, after having had all these uh, uh, this important uh, two days, let's start with uh, try to sum up to have the conclusion of this, of this day. I would, uh, uh, first of all, uh, um, give, give the floor to uh, Madame Ruta Muktupavel, I'm sorry for the, <laughs> which is our guest. So, it's the rector of the Latvian Academy of uh, Culture. Um, Madam Minister, uh, dear colleagues, I understand that during the first uh, session uh, you looked at examples from around the world and now I will try to uh, get you back home at Latvia and in my small presentation uh, I will try to look upon an element of cultural heritage such as a Latvian traditional uh, farmstead uh, and how it interacts with uh, the modern uh, developments and also in, with the context of re-immigration, which is an important issue here in Latvia. So, I will talk about local identity. And how it can contribute to personal growth as well. Because nowadays, of course, we are all talking about globalization and a British sociologist and cultural scientist. Yes, just some technical problems here. So the British uh, sociologist, uh, let me show you him, uh, Zygmunt Bauman. Uh, he believes that uh, now we are talking about uh, the flowing uh, modernity. And uh, in a way, it's, uh, he calls it liquid, and, uh, and he attributes it to the development of technologies, and, uh, and he also talks about the mobility of uh, individuals, uh, which results in an um, scattered identities and also marginalization of cultural heritage and uh, usually both time and space is equally important for human existence and it is very difficult to imagine a human or humanity outside these parameters and Zygmunt Bauman uh, in a way separates these two dimensions and he talks about uh, the solid parameter uh, or location uh, while time is regarded by him as liquid category and pertains to uh, the modernity. And Bauman, uh, just like Anthony Giddens, believes that the social processes in the second past of the 20th century uh, are not contradicting uh, the previous uh, ideas, but rather a continuation. Therefore, we are, should be talking not about uh, postmodernism, but the late modernism. And Bauman, uh, when he talks about these two uh, categories, uh, he also refers to Henry Ford 
and also to Bill Gates as uh, the uh, solid and liquid element. And uh, in this uh, duality between solid and liquid, uh, Bowman believes that uh, the liquid is something positive, something uh, progressive. And he has also uh, mentioned uh, this on several occasions. But as I said, when he talks about uh, the globalized world, where still uh, there is some um, feeling of um, belonging to a certain geographical location and the need to find one's roots and uh, place of belonging is still quite strong. And uh, if, if we look at the, uh, we kind of borrowed from the marketing, the idea that uh, uh, globalization and uh, globalization uh, uh, is becoming increasingly strong because we are looking at local and global at the same time. And uh, therefore, of course, we can talk about these uh, topics uh, not only when we, if, when a country uh, struggles for its independence, but also after joining the EU. And here I'm talking about Latvia. And also at a municipal level, um, level, uh, it is imp still very important for our people to find their identity. And Latvia, which is one of the three Baltic states, And we, as full-fledged uh, members of uh, the uh, uh, EU, uh, have been, uh, unfortunately, uh, oppressed by the Soviet regime. Nevertheless, uh, uh, as soon as we regained uh, the independence, we have uh, stri uh, strived towards uh, the values of the Western Europe. And it was said that in 2030, Latvia will be a country inhabited by responsible and flourishing people where everyone feels uh, as if they belong here. They will be strongly rooted here and uh, in both the traditions and also the newly created physical and mental values, which also include language and culture of Latvia, which will help us to create new values in other spheres, such as culture, science, and other areas. Vision is very nice, but uh, this cannot be imagined without mobility, and mobility is a form of which is uh, long-term or uh, not so long-term immigration has, been, has become one of the most important demographical problems which Latvia has faced after a collapsing of Soviet Union. So the number of inhabitants has uh, reduced by 20 percent, and we have less than tw 2 million people right now. And according to uh, data during, during the last 10 years, 200,000 uh, people have left uh, Latvia. This is according to official data. Uh, since the end of 19th century, uh, we have more than 300,000 uh, inhabitants living abroad. Uh, immigration is not tourism, although some people think so. Uh, immigration weakens the country and psychologically it can also influence rather negatively uh, personality and also hinder its uh, being. Immigrants uh, um, say that uh, they, they feel depressed uh, or in other ways uh, un uncomfortable in the uh, new uh, places of residence and they face uh, uh, crisis of identity. They have lost their uh, harmonic uh, place of living, they have lost their fatherland. And uh, to solve these issues related with uh, immigration, the gov Latin government uh, has adopted three immigration uh, measures with a central idea uh, 
comprising uh, economical aspects, that we should understand that not only economic aspects are those who uh, facilitate the returning of these people back to Latvia, and also symbolic, cultural, and emotional aspects are very, very important. And this is also related to heritage, to cultural, and to all other heritage and the material heritage. And also in this context, uh, cultural heritage is uh, uh, important for uh, long-term sustainable uh, development of a uh, country. And this is a guarantee for uh, uh, belonging, a guarantee for generations to be together and also to ensure a balanced uh, life. Cultural heritage, uh, architectural heritage, and uh, national heritage uh, uh, takes their place in the uh, overall heritage of the country. And this helps people to uh, develop knowledge about uh, their surroundings, environment, on social and uh, also emotional level. Uh, one of the largest forces uh, which uh, facilitates or uh, these ideas is uh, their home, the place of, free, uh, of living, and so also experience first in impressions of life, and this really impresses uh, and influences person's uh, life, uh, future life in future. This uh, home is a symbol of harmony, and this is one, not only one of the most uh, strongest uh, elements for re-immigration. And uh, home, what is home uh, during this uh, this era, and according to Sigmund Bauman, uh, home is uh, everywhere and at the same time nowhere. Mm, some half uh, an ancient, uh, uh, some 50 years ago, uh, uh, home was uh, said to be stability and support in uh, your daily life, and this is uh, paradise and also he warms where you come back at the end of the day for Latin identity. It is a very uh, stable uh, concept uh, historically uh, for people. Uh, uh, we have uh, had a very low density of people, uh, 33, uh, 33 people per uh, square kilometer. Uh, and the place of living traditionally has been a farmstead. And we should admit that uh, also now uh, farmstead one family house is very important for uh, every Latvian or person living in Latvia. This has been included also into Latvian uh, cultural canon. Uh, Farmstead has been depicted also on a uh, Latvian banknote. If you all remember, so we had this uh, picture. And what is uh, Farmstead? Farmstead, according to administrative uh, territorial uh, uh, Division law is uh, one uh, building uh, uh, standing al uh, al alone and functionally uh, related to other buildings, and, and land is primarily used for agriculture or forestry needs. And uh, living houses in Latvia traditionally have been uh, log houses uh, with uh, mm, different types of roofs, uh, uh, trees should be around a uh, well, and also a garden. This is archetypical Latvian farmstead, uh, we should say also ideal place of uh, living. In Latvian uh, language, this uh, notion is uh, called a father's uh, house uh, or father's uh, place. So and this is also related to uh, our first president, Carlos Sulmanis. This is, uh, again, social miss, and this facilitated uh, uh, awakening of 20th century. For instance, in 19, uh, 1989, uh, the number of farmers increased uh, despite of uh, difficulties uh, which were uh, a result of economic crisis and also uh, transformation from collective farming to uh, market economy. Uh, very many people had motivation to continue uh, farming, uh, and it was, it was rather symbolic for, uh, as uh, coming back uh, home. Uh, as a result of the nationalization, very many uh, received back their, uh, their farms, their houses, uh, and started uh, farming. And so uh, agriculture and farming, and also this farm stand, is in every uh, one's, in every Latvian's uh, head. Uh, but uh, after 
joining European Union. The uh, Latvian government uh, defined agriculture as a business, and uh, agriculture lost its uh, historical privilege, and uh, they became uh, similar to other uh, economic sectors. And for uh, very many uh, people uh, in, in the countryside, uh, uh, they do not feel like a tourist sector, and they are now uh, introducing different interesting uh, farming uh, different uh, farming uh, aspects as uh, using, for instance, uh, growing uh, ostrich or something like, like that, which is uh, not uh, really to be related with uh, ancient feeling of uh, father's uh, house. So uh, all this is dominated by uh, different uh, aspects which have, have become uh, modern and temporary right now. And also now we see that uh, the traditionally uh, farmers' uh, uh, way of living has marginalized, uh, but the archetype is changing uh, not so quickly, and we cannot uh, achieve uh, uh, this uh, so so fast. Uh, so again, uh, people still feel that the house should be a harmonic, balanced uh, place, uh, well-being, uh, communication with uh, uh, own people, uh, native language, and also a nice environment, and one of the most stable uh, uh, anchors for this uh, identity is this concept uh, father's house, also experience, which uh, we have uh, got in our childhood, and also this could be a basis of re-immigration. Mm, by the way, here I have quoted uh, uh, words of city uh, Pitskana. She is from the uh, western part of Latvia. And she lives in uh, England uh, since 2006. And she says that, uh, of course, uh, when you live abroad, uh, it is uh, uh, pluses and minuses. So uh, I, I, I am longing for a Latvian sea. I am longing for winds in, in Lepaja. And in the two provinces uh, of uh, Latvia, in uh, Vidzeme and Valka, uh, in 2013 and 14, uh, we have gathered uh, narrative concepts. And then we also can define uh, all these uh, elements, uh, so the feeling of luck and uh, force. Uh, for instance, uh, Gonta Lose has uh, worked in uh, the, uh, she, she has lived in one of the villages and says that uh, her house has been built by her father. Uh, her uh, mother has come to live to this house and her daughter also lives still there. In 2007, according to uh, her initiative, was to establish and uh, manage association on the, about uh, the river. So they were uh, putting everything in, uh, in order. They were cleaning these places. And they also were uh, meant, uh, managing uh, all different uh, nature monuments which are around this uh, river. And they uh, organized uh, places for concerts and uh, exhibitions. And it is just hard to imagine. It's difficult to imagine how his Bauman's liquidity would be perceived by, uh, for example, uh, people from uh, Valkas, uh, Valka town, Janis Jaroms in this case, who still lives in his uh, grandfather's house who have li and actually his uh, predecessors um, are, um, have lived there for several hundreds of years. And uh, Laila Ozolina believes that uh, the places of childhood uh, is are the ones that uh, actually uh, per encourage her to stay here in Latvia instead of um, uh, going abroad. However, when uh, she had to leave Latvia to work abroad, uh, she left her uh, child uh, in the care of her grandmother uh, simply because of better career opportunities elsewhere. And she called back home, and she asked whether she should return. And uh, her mother said, you know, everything is all right here. However, uh, he's crossing out the days in the calendar. Uh, since the time you have left. And at the same time, Lila uh, returned to Latvia because she's, she believes that uh, this farmstead 
and childhood's uh, places are the ones that are very important and uh, for a children for a child without his mother this place wouldn't be as valuable and uh, what could be the conclusions uh, of course in this liquid modernity um, we can apply this principle to a large part of uh, Western civilization. However, one third of Latvians live in rural areas and uh, uh, in Latvian legislation uh, there should be at least 2,000 permanent residents to be called city. However, there are also some uh, traditional cities uh, with even smaller population. However, in the global or European uh, scale, apart from Riga, there would practically be no cities here in uh, Latvia. We should be only talking about rural residents who still live in this solid environment rather than uh, embrace this uh, modern liquidity and still man maintain very strong ties and uh, roots uh, in these rural areas. Should we treat them as savages uh, found in, uh, in some colonies? Um, I don't think so. Uh, however, um, of course, we cannot also treat them as a product of uh, modern liquidity because this, uh, in the conditions of um, uh, this uh, liquidity, the fragmented existence creates um, confusion. And, in, uh, and here, it is the cultural background that uh, may bring some stability to this instability and liquidity. Therefore, uh, the, a, har a harmony with the environment is very important. And the, the, the deeper the roots uh, and uh, the deeper someone's connections to his or her place, the more important it is to have uh, a quality environment. And there is also a, a, a correlation between high uh, level of feeling of belonging and also the need to maintain this place uh, along with the uh, culture, language, and other values, which, or an, the entirety of which uh, creates uh, the culture of each nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this intervention, which uh, reminded us the important and fundamental uh, role of culture in bridging uh, past, present, and future in a society. And uh, I also would like to stress uh, this morning there was an intervention stressing it. Uh, uh, looking for the yesterday, Alexander War was uh, saying we were looking for the magic formula. And today uh, it was stressed that young generation is one of the uh, factor of this magic formula and uh, we are here in an art academy where uh, uh, the new generation of the creators of the heritage of tomorrow are, uh, are around us and they were silently moving around us it was uh, also uh, important to have such a venue while, well, with, yeah. while we really uh, look at the future also yeah. in, in the in the next generation so thanks again and uh, now again uh, we go to the Sorry if we continue with this anal with analogy. Uh, let's look at the main course <laughs> with the breakout session today. Um, well, I, I assisted to both to some of the session. It was all of them were interesting uh, and uh, there was a lively debate. So I, I kindly ask uh, uh, to the first of the two reporters uh, to. Um, uh, Come here and uh, uh, yes, Giuliana De Francesco. Giuliana De Francesco is the first supporter for the uh, session on contemporary architecture and heritage. 
and uh, she's head of unit of uh, European relations at the Italian Ministry of Cultural Heritage, uh, Cultural Heritage, Cultural Activities and Tourism of Italy as a background in classical antiquities, but also an extensive experience in European projects and also in European uh, policies. Uh, Giuliana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for this excellent organization and for the care they put in every detail. So we feel very welcome here. I wanted to say that. Um, <laughs> and um, secondly, I, want, I would like also to thank for this important task uh, that I was given. I'm very proud of that. I, I hope to be up to the task. But I apologize in advance if something is missed or misunderstood. So, first of all, I must say I was attending two sessions, the session A on uh, um, contemporary architecture and heritage and co uh, session C, contemporary architecture, heritage and awareness. And uh, there was a kind of uh, fil rouge going across these two sessions, which was the importance of dialogue. Dialogue across professionals involved in heritage and contemporary architecture and design, dialogue between professionals and the society, dialogue with the political level, and also dialogue between architecture, space, environment, uh, and, and so on. This was the, if I had to summarize this in a few words, this would be the outcome. Uh, in the, the first intervention of the first session was by Professor Vassallo of the University of Architecture in Venice that was reporting about an important intervention of restoration in the Basilica in Vicenza, the most important urban work by Andrea Palladio, an important Italian architect from the 16th century. Uh, the aim was to clean, reinforce and protect the basilica, but also repair the harm done with the previous restoration and uh, add some new facilities to the building. The intervention was very complex and sophisticated and was based on one hand on the study of the materials and the techniques that were used for the original construction and uh, based on the documentation of the different restoration and maintenance intervention that had taken place over time. On the other hand, it was an historical research carried out on the material structure of the monument, uh, investigating both visible and not immediately visible elements, and uh, um, the, whole, the overall uh, um, enterprise looked at innovation. So choices were made on sound knowledge of the materials and on the previous uh, work done, but cutting edge structural solutions were put in place to respect the original design, the colors and the function, while at the same time allowing to install new plants, new facilities, new function to the basilica. So as a result, the building was returned to its original role as the most important historic building in the town of Vicenza. It was given back to the public, to the widest used by citizens, and by the tourists that attend events um, in, in big, um, big numbers. The second um, intervention was by the director of the Museum of Europe and the Mediterranean in Marseille, Jean-Francois Chounier, I hope to pronounce it well. And uh, this was a case study and a success story based on four main elements. The first element was the need, um, the, the, the plan, the new plan for the city that began in the mid 90s and it includes uh, the area of the port of Marseille. So this new planning made possible to have the money, the space, and to take a, an initiative for a long-term intervention. Um, in the port, immigrants used to arrive in Marseille, but the area had been closed in the, in the 70s. So the city in the 90s decided to reopen this area, uh, creating uh, um, several cultural venues and the second important element in this project was that the idea was also to reopen to the public a historical building that was a big landmark that had not been used by the public for many centuries. And this was a fortress, uh, the Fort Saint-Jean, near, um, near to the port. Um, 
um, the reason uh, why this project was put in place was also the, um, the fact that Marseille was, pronounced, was elected European Capital of Culture for 2013. So there was a clear deadline for the completion of the project. Uh, the fourth important element was um, together with the uh, renovation and reopening to the public of an historical building was the creation of a new museum, a completely new contemporary architecture that made use of experimental materials, um, such as a special concrete with uh, high resistance capacity. And uh, the result was a flexible structure combining two buildings open to the public, hosting uh, a temporary and um, permanent exhibition devoted to the civilization of the Mediterranean, not just the, the French one, and uh, connected to the main town through, also visibly through pedestrian bridges. So the, the, the success in creating this new landmark was uh, um, through creating a new waterfront for, for the city and combining both the history and the contemporary culture of uh, Marseille. Um, and uh, it resulted in historic building having a function for the society. Um, the third the third uh, uh, presentation this morning was by um, Marianne Cedre from the Snowheta Architecture Company in uh, um, Norway. Um, also, this intervention was focused on dialogue between architecture, environment, and society. Um, the main um, in inspiration uh, by Snowheta is that architecture is about psychology of space. Um, it can reflect dimensions of the past, the present, and of the future. So digging into the past is needed in order to plan for a new future, and this bridge between is, is, the, is the present moment. Uh, and this involves relation to what's happening outside the building, to environment and to nature. So in this studio, different professionals cooperate with the focus on creativity and the creative process. Um, the values of the company include sharing knowledge, teamwork, uh, actively involving young talents, uh, and uh, mastering knowledge, so preparation. Um, and an important role is uh, played by the communication between um, people in the, um, in the company, and this communication is mainly physical. Their story begins with uh, winning the competition for the Library of Alexandria in Egypt in 1989, uh, which was planned as a very modern building, but uh, tightly relating to its historical uh, context, so in constant dialogue with the conditions around it. Um, then we could see uh, several different projects where heritage uh, always plays a role because in every project uh, there is a context to be understood and when intervening in an historical context uh, uh, it is a balance between the future and the past is always needed and uh, new technologies and new tools can help there uh, to create a dialogue between past and future. Um, I would like to mention one of these exciting projects, which is the um, opera in Oslo, because this building is the youngest protected building in the world. It was finalized uh, less than 10 years ago, and this is changing the concept of heritage. Um, this, Snow had, has, had this dream to combine the building with the space, uh, get it in contact with the front, waterfront, relate the building with the city and the people in the city and the way to fulfill this uh, dream, this vision, was to share it with the public. Um, they realized it also through collaboration with artists. There are pieces of art in the building that are integral part of it. And to be short, uh, the success is that people um, feel this construction and the environment around the construction, construction belongs to them. It's not uh, a work made by architects, but it's a work belonging to the people in the town. So what these three projects had in common was the public access and the public ownership uh, that resulted from uh, cutting edge interventions uh, in historical environments. 
Um, so we um, concluded that in order to care for cultural heritage, we need to take research and contemporary architecture into account. And uh, things become possible, exciting, and interesting through dialogue. Um, so one of the aims of this conference might be to foster dialogues, dialogue between different professions, between professionals and people, and uh, with the polit politicians that are in charge of decisions and develop the vision. Um, so there will be in the next years a need to strengthen the dialogue across uh, the professionals, the society, and the political level. Uh, this was about the first session. I hope it was not too, too long and not too confused. Well, too long. Okay, next <laughs> one will be shorter. <laughs> Please. Um, sh should, I should I continue with the next one? Or let's... Um, if you can summarize... Uh, the more briefly. Okay. Yeah, but a little bit, yeah, shorter. Okay, the second session was about... Uh, okay. was also continuing the, the, the third session, in fact, uh, the session C, Contemporary Architecture as a Heritage and Awareness was also um, a dialogue across uh, three different uh, professionals uh, from the political level, um, an architect and a communication expert. So in this session, we scaled up the dialogue to the political level. Uh, we had uh, Pirio Sanaxenaho, I apologize again for my pronunciation, um, um, from a, an architect studio in Helsinki that reported about several examples combining new buildings with uh, an old environment, mm -hmm. respecting uh, um, the use of original materials, uh, such as, for example, in this Vasa factory, the use that was one of the examples, the use of wood and of red bricks, and the reinterpretation of traditional elements of the local architecture, such as in this case, uh, long windows. Um, other examples were less uh, successful. There were innovative projects seeking to uh, respect traditional construction practices while renovating old buildings that were not implemented because of an opposition by the uh, Heritage Protection Authority uh, against modifications in the appearance, uh, in this case of a circular water tower from 1938 that was not uh, used anymore. And uh, an exciting uh, project that was presented was uh, about um, an ecumenical art chapel in Turku, a main town in, um, in Finland. Uh, that has a medieval past. The idea there was to create a new church that was open to all uh, uh, Christians, so that was ecumenical. Uh, it was based uh, on one hand uh, on the traditional form of the church, but on the other hand on symbolic aspects, such as the fish, so that this church has, a, has the form of a fish that is a symbol of early Christianity. Uh, and other symbolic values involve the use of light. So the building is structured in such a way that people enter it through shadowy spaces and uh, look at the light in the, at the bottom and they don't see the source of this light. So this is a kind of interpretation of the spirituality expressed by the church and this is also an interesting aspect of dialogue with uh, symbolic and religi religious values. Another main project was presented by the mayor on Nantes, Patrick Rimbert. It's uh, an urban renewal project uh, of the town of La Nantes, located on two sides of uh, the River Loire. Today it has 600,000 inhabitants, and the object of the intervention was the Ile de Nantes, so an island located in the middle of the river in between the two sides of the town. The dilemma was uh, um, about determining the future of this area that was devoted to shipyards, but shipyards and shipbuildings had been closed down in, at the end of the 80, 80s. So should these structures be removed, uh, should, should they be kept? The reflection was led together with architects and urban planners, but also artists were invited to perform in this area that was abandoned in order to re-establish a dialogue with uh, the citizens. And um, the cult culture was in this case, cultural activities were an icebreaker, allowing to uh, re-establish this, this contact between the, this area and uh, the citizens. So in the end, it was implemented a unique uh, concept for this uh, 
Island, there was a competition and uh, after this competition was won, the project was implemented in 10 years. Um, the traditional metal structure were maintained but reused for completely different functions, including plenty of cultural activities, but also private businesses, uh, there are apartments and so on. So on one hand, the historic layers of, of the island were kept and exposed. On the other hand, there was good quality contemporary architecture and the quality of the project attracted people to the island. And this is a success story because people not only love to go there, but they want to live there and to establish their businesses there. Um, investments were made also in contemporary art uh, and, and so on. So the regeneration of the island uh, that, and this attracted also tourists mm -hmm. to Nantes. So the regeneration of this part of the city is based on its historic heritage and acts as a catalyst for the development of the whole, uh, of the whole city. Important aspects of this project were communication and involvement of professionals and of citizens and at every stage. Which brings us to the last, uh, communication, uh, last intervention about communication. We had an intervention by a communication professional that works with architects to um, clarify how lack of communication can disrupt not just the, the, the project but the perception that people have uh, of the project. So um, he raises awareness on the fact that um, we have to uh, communicate what is being done and professionals have to invest effort to communicate what is being done to preserve and restore uh, cultural heritage but also to implement contemporary architecture because it should be clear that how this can be benefit the community and the society because the risk is otherwise that bad communication might harm the project, uh, might damage the public perception of architecture and uh, undermine the understanding the society has for public buildings and uh, for public spaces, risking uh, to develop the thought that all this is developed based on private interest and not for the for the public good. Uh, so there is a need of proactivity in the communication of, of projects, whatever projects in, in this field. Um, uh, the, the discussion confirmed uh, the, the, the issues at stake. And then finally, uh, we had a brief communication. Um, I mean, the, it, uh, sorry, I want to mention this last thing about the discussion that uh, clarified that the success of this project was that the project was owned by the inhabitants of Nantes. It was not, uh, because there was a question about how could you, as a city council lasting five years, um, ensure that a long-lasting project was implemented afterwards. So the main point was the communication and the fact that People were involved and were owning, in a way, the project. Um, at the very end of the session, we had a communication uh, by Uwe Koch about, uh, from the um, uh, Monument uh, Preservation Office in, in Germany about uh, the idea of developing the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018. Um, and as a way of uh, establishing Europe as a history by itself and not the addition of different national histories. Sorry for being long. <laughs> uh, yes, oh, I'm sorry because our time we are, we are a little late, so, but thank you for adding this, uh, for this, for this detailed report and for adding the word dialogue to the magic formula. So, <laughs> uh, I want to pass immediately to the next uh, rapporteur, I don't want to lose time, and uh, Marianne Lettimaki, which is a consultant of the Baltic Sea Region Monitoring Group on Heritage Cooperation uh, in Finland, and uh, she will report on the session on design, heritage, and accessibility in the second part of the session. Uh, we have two sessions with design and uh, actually and, and then the, the first one was design and heritage and the second one design heritage and accessibility and uh, maybe even the first one I think that it was about uh, intellectual accessibility for the heritage and uh, we started with the Danish practicing architect Trina Naple who was saying, presenting herself that she's an architect 
deep in the buildings and she wanted to uh, transmit us what is for the heritage sector, what is the understanding of, uh, of the, this task of, of this kind of practicing architect. And uh, the, the task is to develop uh, <laughs> buildings to get new life, which means transformation and conservation work. And the task is uh, to make the house, what, what is it, uh, from what the house is, to make a vision of what the house will be. Integrated in our time, but, but having a line back, a clear client back. And then that there is also that you, as an architect, you have to dare to make the necessary changes in an elegant way as the new function is as valuable as the old one. Otherwise, it will not last. It will make new changes. And this process, it starts by studying the building very profoundly and mapping its values, both those experienced and documented values. And among uh, those experiences valued, uh, Trina mentioned the ambience value what is the feeling, what is the way, how, how this building surrounds us. And she was giving, I think that it's your personal, for forgiveness factor. What is the forgiveness factor of this hall? How we feel it, how it makes us to feel. And then there is a challenge how to communicate it and how to, to make measures to preserve it. And her warnings were, don't uh, turn buildings to museums, don't mistrust our time, and then there is a challenge to manage the newest technology, and this is especially the ventilation. So we have too many uh, examples of how a healthy heritage house has turned out to be a sick patient because of the wrong, wrong measures. And we have to remember that you have to use the building or you have to lo lose it. And we have to work for a holistic way. And uh, her good practi practices were built on facts that cultural heritage creates identity. Cultural heritage creates experience. Cultural heritage is a resource. Cultural heritage is dynamic and cultural heritage allows for development based on tradition. So this gives an, us courage to make these things. And I think, I, I'm sorry for you who were not, because you missed these interesting photos. That's a, one of the most, I think, in European scale, mm. elegant restorations are made in Denmark. So actually we had a session with, uh, of three architect women from the Northern Europe and transmitting the next one was uh, Ele Aun from Coco Architects. Trine is from Möller Architects in Denmark and Coco Architects. And, and she was explaining us and giving a good example of the seaplane hangars in Dowlings, which were transformed to the Maritime Museum, very successful museum. And, um, it was a process of healing a building which was sick because the lack of maintenance. And when creating new uses, uh, they enhanced an attention also to the building itself so that it was not anymore like a storage or just covering something, but to, to show the values of the construction, special construction of the buildings. And, and to have the experience of the interior. interior. And also there was, uh, when this trans transformation process took place, it was possible to create an access to the waterfront and open a former military area to the public space and give new uh, activities. And then we had Osa Dalin from the Stockholm municipality and, and she was uh, telling us the rapid, rapidly changing urban landscape. And uh, 
giving us very good examples, then I, I think that this uh, of, of the collaboration and dialogue. And then again, if we are looking for the European example, Sweden is one of those countries we should, should study very clearly. And also you were mentioning the dive uh, pro, uh, analysis which was made in Norway. I think that in the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. there is a lot of work with that. Maybe also based on that fact that we are living in the wooden houses which they, keep, uh, they need maintenance, they need owners who understand how the houses should be maintained and in order to, be, to have them alive we ha have to have this dialogue, that this, this understanding continues. So she was giving us example on policy documents and creative design processes. And in Stockholm, uh, there should be 140 houses, 140,000 houses should be built by 2030, which means that there have to be awareness of cultural heritage and architectural quality in this, in, in this kind of pressure of, of using land use and uh, building. And they're, they're, therefore, they are working with developing different kind of policies and methodologies to, to, to answer to this pressure. And recommendation on the historic urban landscape by the UNESCO from 2011 is, uh, is the one of the, how do you say, most important policy, international policy documents, because it gives, gives this broader urban context about the sites, topography, about the built environment, the historic and contemporary, the infrastructures, the open spaces, the gardens, land use patterns, and spatial organization. So it means that you, you, you get this holistic view. And then, not to forget, also intangible dimensions of heritage related to the diversity and identity. And, uh, she was giving examples of a walkable, walkable city and very nice pavilions they have made, movable pavilions to, to places for dialogue, for public dialogues in, when they are making changes and plans. So er, very early phase, they start these public dialogues. And they have professional statements uh, from the city museum and they have the Stockholm Beauty Council, which is also giving uh, or taking part to this discussion. And then collab collaboration with the county administri administrative board and other forms on dialogues and heritage analysis and workshops and heritage impact assessments, assessments of planning proposals guidance for specific kinds of planning permissions and uh, collaboration with the research community and different kind of strategy. It was very imposing this, this, uh, the, to see the breadth and depth of the work they are working with. And then we had this other session uh, of heritage, design heritage and accessibility and now we move to the Central Europe up to the Italy with three men designers. And the first one uh, came from Austria, Austria Martin Foeselator. And she, uh, he studied that uh, all this uh, process of design, it, uh, the point of departure is to understand people. The people are the, the target group. And uh, for him, he was making it as easy to understand the point, so he was saying that the very simple way that the basic questions are how to receive and how to give. How, uh, how, design, how to design the points of transition in daily life. In daily life. And the process would be to, to create an atmosphere, make it easy, easy to enter and easy to escape, and cool feeling. Now you, you, I don't know exactly what is the content of this term, but it means also to create platforms for social interaction and to use what exists to create, uh, to, to create 
what is to be. So it means that in Swedish you, ha you say man tar va man har. Uh, it means one takes what, what one has. And, and this is also one way to, to look up to heritage that what we have inside the heritage and then how to use it further. And then we had um, Pete Kucher from uh, Italy, uh, from Design for All Europe. And uh, he started to, to ask about uh, that when we are speaking about the cultural heritage, what do we mean with it? To whom uh, do we need it? And is it cost effective? And then if we think about the heritage and accessibility, he was uh, putting two figures uh, in relation to each other. And the first is that uh, people with, with disabilities in the Europe this year, uh, no, last year, 2014, is estimated to be like 60% of the inhabitants. It means 80 million people. And this, uh, actually, this number is much bigger because in reality, disability is part of the human life in the very beginning for all of us. At the very end, it is also for the most of us. And not seldom, it is also in between those points. So it, is, it concerns and all us when we are talking about accessibility. And it means that our task is to resign the environment's accessibility, all this. And then if we think about this, uh, her why this to heritage and is it cost effective, he took up that uh, as, uh, that uh, accessibility to tourism is, worth, is calculated to be worth of 800, 800 billion euros per year. So this is, of course, this is always difficult to, to understand these calculations, but it means also that there is a huge income if we are able to, to make this heritage Accessibility, accessibility to all, and then that, that there are all kinds of tourism, tourists. And then we got good examples of that. And one of the, how do you say, when we were talking about uh, economy and costs, uh, we were advised to consider what are the costs of impacts of not doing the issues, that there is a process that we will miss income if we are not doing these changes. And the last one in this session was Art Oxenar from Amsterdam, Amsterdam municipality, giving examples about how they try, uh, how they want to make uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam accessibility for people and bicycles. And they are working with public spaces in order to regain them for people from cars. Opening buildings towards areas where people are. And here, as you said, that we were discussing this Alexandra Wars X factor. What is that? And it, that it can be students, new, uh, new groups of audiences, new uses of buildings, connecting, connecting neighborhoods, giving room for pedestrians. And there should be uh, many strategies for reuse. And also to think about that, that we, uh, we have to develop pop-up reuses when there is a risk of neglect. And we have to think what kind of enabling processes we are able uh, to make. So I think that um, this was tasks in different scales and, and very inspiring, inspiring examples. Thank you. Thank you. For <laughs> Thank you. Thank both the, the rapporteurs because it was really, uh, the, both the sessions were very, very rich and it was difficult to report all the, the, the discussion, so you well, took a little time more than expected, but maybe because it was a rich debate. So.
I pick up the two uh, ingredients this time, and, uh, but you, you can add if you wish. Uh, one is use it or lose it. I like this. Uh, but uh, another uh, key ingredient to me is but always people uh, make people uh, at the heart of our policies. In any case, this is a key to really to transform and to manage, uh, to manage the, 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 the change that we, we, we are living. Um, now we have another interesting uh, contribution because we have a report from the social networks uh, from uh, Katrina Kukaina, which is uh, deputy head uh, of the State Inspection for Heritage Protection in uh, Latvia. And uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I truly hope that uh, you enjoyed these two days in Riga, just like we enjoyed uh, having you here. And among us, uh, of course, not only here, um, but also abroad, uh, we had a wide audience uh, to our live streams and also followed us on social networks. And if I had to summarize what I read on f the Facebook and uh, Twitter, then I would say, you know, everybody was quite happy. But to be more specific <coughs> about what has been said about us uh, on the Internet, and uh, I would also like to take a look at what uh, you have said upon registering for the conference. And for example, uh, that contemporary architecture and design can uh, attribute uh, additional value uh, to our culture and uh, in this globalized world. And European, mm, European heritage is a strategic uh, resource for a multifaceted uh, Europe and uh, this interaction between contemporary design and uh, heritage finally has been brought to political level because otherwise we cannot be talking about a su sustainable future. And uh, the next uh, emphasis was put on finding the new functions, namely the best way to conserve a building is to find the new application for this building. Otherwise, it will be lost. And in modern times, we have to have a deeper understanding of uh, what specifically makes a certain building special and why it should be preserved. We still have a lot of unkept and uh, neglected uh, buildings. Uh, along with many social and financial problems. Uh, however, uh, we still have to um, put right our priorities and uh, also pay attention to adjusting uh, the cultural heritage to the modern needs by using appropriate techniques and materials. And. Uh, also, uh, the commentators on the internet said that uh, sometimes the change in functionality can also lead to a certain negative um, consequences. And someone said that uh, sometimes uh, the newly assigned function can be misunderstood uh, or, or, or someone, sometimes we could be telling about selling out where uh, in order to attract uh, as many uh, visitors as possible, uh, we may uh, destroy our heritage. And uh, also the transformations of churches has been discussed quite widely, both in Latvia and Europe. And since people are leaving rural areas, uh, there is a problem of neglected um, um, rural churches and uh, we have to think about how to use them uh, probably by turning them into theaters libraries or restaurants because we have such examples abroad also the accessibility was emphasized on many occasions 
and uh, accessibility and uh, new functions are very important in order for uh, the heritage to live on. And this task should be uh, implemented by applying architectural and design um, solutions uh, together with uh, responsible planning. But of course, here we should also be talking about the physical, mental, virtual, and also spiritual accessibility. The next aspect was identity, and um, because uh, many commentators said that there is a risk to lose the identity, and uh, historic cities sometimes fail to uh, adjust their functionality to the contemporary needs and standards, and thus they lose their attractiveness, and uh, therefore they turn to the tourism business alone which, of course, is also a risky business in a way. Therefore, it is very important to find the right balance between the specifics of the historic, a historic site and the ways of uh, adjusting it to the contemporary needs. And we can uh, say that uh, historic heritage uh, forms the identity of each city. However, uh, we have to find the best approach. Uh, we have to think about the fourth dimension, namely the time and the role the time plays in all this process. Then uh, when we talk about dialogue and interaction, uh, commentators uh, uh, say that, you know, uh, uh, a good architecture should not uh, be a parody of history, but uh, rather uh, put emphasis on the history, and uh, we should uh, maintain uh, several principles, uh, such as uh, uh, maintaining quality visual uh, image and uh, use the design, uh, and they should be uh, user-oriented and uh, in order to achieve a situation where the users uh, interact with our designs uh, according to our plans. And uh, of course, uh, we should also talk more about uh, the interaction between industrial heritage and the public space. And uh, also, the authentic authenticity has been emphasized. And uh, of course, um, uh, we have to be very professional and uh, very uh, daring sometimes to accept uh, what we have inherited from, uh, from the past and uh, how we should uh, deal with it uh, nowadays. And uh, of course, each era brings its own um, uh, prerequisites and, and um, requirements uh, regarding how we treat our architecture or in general uh, surroundings. And uh, it, of course, requires a healthy balance between, between the past and, and the future. And um, it was also said that uh, architectural competitions uh, could be used as a very good tool to actually uh, in, uh, find new solutions to the problems that we have discussed. And uh, in the very end, I would like to say that uh, we should be all aware that our future is hidden in our past. So thank you very much. Opportunity to thank uh, the audience, because all of you had to contribute uh, with your uh, with your comments uh, at uh, when you, when you ascribed and so and we have, we have just seen how much interesting were those contributions and I can testify that so the presidency made their best to include all these messages and all this input in the uh, joint statement. Uh, another key important uh, aspect was that of the authenticity. We don't have to forget that authenticity uh, it is for Europe it is an asset and it's a unique asset uh, in the global dimension. So we want to stress also this point. 
And uh, now it's time to, to, to move to, the, um, to look at this uh, joint statement that will resume all the principles and uh, all the concepts that, that we have uh, dealt with in these two days. I will now uh, pass uh, to um, give the floor to uh, Jose Maria Ballester, which is a renowned heritage expert. He actually is the director of the Rural Development Area of the Botin Foundation, but uh, uh, what we also know that he played an important role in the, in the Council of Europe uh, and uh, doesn't want to, <laughs> please. Madam Minister, ladies and gentlemen, my first word must be of thanks to the Latin Presidency of the European Union Council for their invitation and to my good friend Julius Dambis, having come so many times for improving cooperation with Latvia, you can imagine that I'm delighted uh, to attend this conference. You mentioned, Madam Chair, that uh, <coughs> there are uh, different approaches uh, to discuss the theme of this uh, meeting. The conclusions uh, just adopted by participants in the Congress have rightly underlined the evolution of the very concept of cultural heritage over recent years. This evolution has gone beyond the limits of the heritage built or created by the hand of man to merge with environment, so arriving at a new vision of landscape, natural, rural, urban, periurban, as established by the European Landscape Convention. <coughs> this teaches us that the true heritage is the territory. But the final point of this evolution is the territory. The territory itself, when we take into consideration in a global and transversal manner its natural and cultural resources, its historical development, and the impression left by the life of its successive inhabitants. This is why it is so important to understand the territory with all those factors before designing whatever new features prove necessary. Allow me, allow me to quote a Spanish philosopher, Julián Marías, who proposes the intelligibility of history and of the heritage be quoted to us by that history in order to achieve its true interpretation. As another intellectual of my country, John Juaristi, recently reminded us, interpreting the idea of Marias, intelligere, the Latin word, is not, is not only a purely intellectual operation, it is also necessary to install oneself in a circumstance, in this case the territory, accepting it as the starting point of a new stage in the living process, in our, in our case, new interventions, planning the integration, the integration of all the new into a single flow of history. For what it is not intelligible, this commentator's plane appears to us as strange and hostile is opposed to us. Hence the importance we must attribute to intelligibility when assuming the delicate responsibility of making the old compatible with the new, when it is not merely a question of aesthetic, but also, also of ethics. This is to say, when we attribute to design and to the creative capacity of competent people, the responsibility of configuring the framework for our citizens' daily life, their equilibrium and their happiness. This idea, 
this idea was already stated many years ago, but uh, the French expert, very well known of masters of us, uh, the French expert Françoise Choet in her book, The Allegory of the Heritage, when to explain the transcendence of this action, she said that the aim is to transmit competence in building, all that, all that such competence implies, to teach and learn, to perceive, to realize, in other words, to implant, articulate, differentiate, provide buildings in the human environment, conditioned by the importance of its details. This implies, ladies and gentlemen, a whole a whole vision of the world and a truly social option. It's not only a question between new and old. It is not only a question between new architectural integration or no integration. Of course, these questions are very important, but it's mainly uh, the fact of having a vision of the world and, and to choice, to be able to choose a social option. And here, in my opinion, resides one of the keys to the, model, to the model of society we have to bequeath to future generations. I think that this, uh, that this is our true challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, so I think it's time to pass to, the, to, to read the statement, the final version of the statement, uh, in order to see if there's uh, this final version, it is uh, satisfy all the, and uh, meets all the comments and all the suggestions that uh, you made. I invite uh, now Christopher Young to, to, to illustrate this <laughs> final version, discussed and... Uh... Well, Christopher Young is a heritage consultant and uh, it's an independent heritage consultant. He has an extensive expertise, mainly focused on the management of the historical environment, particularly related to World Heritage Convention but also, he work also in the, in the English heritage. Yes, sir. Um, can I say first, thank you for inviting me to take part in this conference, and thank you for the opportunity to work on this statement. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be back in Latvia again, and there's a certain sense of deja vu, although it was a different room, because 15 years ago, almost, I was rapporteur for the Riga Charter, which is mentioned in the preliminaries to this joint statement. Um, I hope it doesn't take as long to agree the final detail as it did to agree the final detail of the Riga Charter, but that's another story. The statement that you have was prepared by a working group about a month ago and was then circulated for comment to all the people coming to this meeting and also to some other groups such as the EU Reflection Group on Cultural Heritage. A further version was circulated at the meeting this week um, and <coughs> you were asked to put any further proposals you had in for consideration. The, what we'll do now, I'm suggesting we do now, is that we go through the statement on the screen. Additions, which all result from comments made by people here, or who have been here, are highlighted in yellow, um, and any deletions are struck through and highlighted in yellow so that you can see what there is there. I suggest that we go right the way through looking at the additional points and then at the end 
if the, once we've dealt with all those, I will ask if anybody else has any other changes they want to suggest. But I think it's probably simpler to go straight through so you can see it all in one go, and then we'll see if there's anything left over at the end. Right. <coughs> Starting with the preamble, the recognizing part, in the first bullet point, we've added both tangible and intangible to clarify that we're talking about all aspects of cultural heritage. And we've generalized the value statement in the second line by deleting the most, so it just talks about outstanding values. Does anybody have any comments on any of that? Thank you. In the second, third bullet point, we were asked to bring in the idea of the need for continued use of heritage. This comes back to the use it or lose it theme which has emerged from the conference. And I should say that if there are grammatical errors in it still, um, we'll deal with those afterwards. I don't need to be told we need an of in this bullet point now, which I've just noticed, although I wrote it. Um, everybody happy with that? Okay. In the next bullet point, number four, can we go back? So we're still on the bullet points. Um, we have thought that we should be trying to create an inspiring environment, environment for the present generation as well as for the futures. Why should we just be working for them and not for us as well? Everybody happy with that? Yes, I At thought least. you would be. Now, if we go over the page onto what we are calling upon international government and municipal bodies, everybody to do, in bullet point one, we've added the idea of and history to identity of every location in Europe, since there are occasions when the history of a place may not have had a positive impact on its identity. Any comments? Is everybody happy with that? Bullet point two was not changed. Bullet point, I mean, number three was not changed. Can I come back to it afterwards? Well, I've dealt with these changes, so we said, looked at it all. Um, <coughs> in four, we were asked to add a reference to sustainable and quality tourism, which we've done by adding that phrase at the end. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. And in five, we have um, included, we've combined two requests at least into this idea. First is the idea that came out as one component of Alexandra's magic formula yesterday, which is that the idea that you need to assess the value of cultural heritage in order to decide what to change and what not. Um, and so we've introduced there the idea that any change has to be based on proper assessment of the values of cultural heritage. And a second point is the need to anchor assessment of values into the actual technical aspects and the material aspects of the heritage, which was a request also from another direction. So we've put both those points in. Um, I think that it still makes sense as a whole, and I think that strength, both points strengthen it. Is everybody happy with that? Thank you. In six, um, this comes out of the session in the new building across there this morning, <coughs> where there was a lot of focus on demographic change and what that is going to do to us in the next few generations, or in the next 20 years, effectively. And the idea that superb architecture and design needs to take account of demographic change and the need to think more about accessibility and so on as you get a population which is increasingly less able to run upstairs three at a time, like I could once, but can't now, because my knees won't take it. Um, and so we've introduced that idea into there. Okay, everybody happy with that? Right. In the last paragraph, <coughs> You've introduced two points. 
One is a reference to the proposed European Heritage Year in 2018 as a, as a means by which we can heighten awareness of heritage and, so, and the principles outlined in this statement. And the second is to deal not just with formal levels of education, but the framework of lifelong learning, which we're meant to do from the moment we're born until the moment we die. Um, is everybody happy with that as an addition? Thank you. Right, now just coming back, are there any other general points? I know that Dr. O'Dwyer has one on number two. Anything else? Yes? Um, can I take, if I take Freddie's first and then I'll come to you. <coughs> Freddie O'Dwyer from Ireland. I mean, I'm, the point two, um, the difficulty I have is with original elements. It's something we've had to address in our own national guidelines because what is original Sorry, could you say that a bit slower? Sorry, I just, I put on my glasses. Um, it's just the, the difficulty I have was because only original elements are of the highest value and evidence of cultural diversity. We've dealt with this in our own national guidelines. In other words, that buildings, which are the products of many phases, and we would have had an example this morning with the Basilica in Vicenza, which I think the professor told us is now on its fourth roof, having started the medieval times, been rebuilt three times since Cologne Cathedral, and probably rebuilt about four times. Um, so what are original elements? The problem we've had, for instance, after the Second World War, was some buildings were restored say, to medieval appearance with Baroque elements removed. I would suggest that only original, should, the only should be taken out. I think it really causes confusion. Okay, is everybody happy with that? The idea of deleting only in the second line of and two? Yes, oh, just take out only. And I would suggest also, at the, in the last sentence, uh, replicating buildings or architectural size is exceptional, acceptable only in exceptional circumstances. Um, there may be cases, certainly, where you might have a building in the middle of a uniform terrace that's destroyed, or maybe a medieval building where there's damage that you have to rebuild it. You have to rebuild in the original style. So I would suggest the exceptional circumstances is too restrictive, and I would propose the addition of the wording, exceptional circumstances and are in appropriate contexts. Only in exceptional circumstances and appropriate contexts. In exceptional circumstances and are appropriate contexts. And appropriate contexts. Well, and I say and are, uh, because it could or. be both, it could be both, yeah. Does anybody want to comment on that? Because, I mean, this was the issue which brought me to Riga in 2000. And it, at the time, replication of buildings which had been destroyed was a very sensitive issue in most of Eastern Europe. And I think may still be. Juris, do you want to? Yes, there's a microphone coming. Very sorry that I've interrupted in this very important moment, but exactly. I came to hours uh, before from Poland, and this point in this statement is the most important point from my point of view. Maybe if you're for U West European, it is not a big problem, but for the East Europe, former communist countries, it the main score. So it's not so easy to change few words. With this changing of few words, we will change the sense of this text. And for us, it's extremely important to have the declaration which stress <laughs> the authenticity of the monuments as the most important uh, aspect of the monument preservation and to minimize re risk that next generation will replicate our uh, mistakes by uh, reconstructing of the non-existent monuments on a very poor and obscure way, which many examples I can show you in whole Middle East Europe, because uh, otherwise we will lost uh, really the chance to have uh, modern architecture in our cities. Uh, 
it's not a critic, of course, it's a, a constatation. But I wrote the list of the members of this conference, and as you remarked, uh, a minority of the representatives who present the wonderful examples came from West Europe. And it is a problem, which for you it's not so extreme important. Uh, for East European, after the experience which made Poland after 45 <laughs> until the reconstruction of the Royal Castle in Warsaw, and what happened after 18 when each country which lost something tried to uh, reconstruct it once again, and I am speaking uh, first of all in my, about my own country where we had to accept uh, initiatives which put into our uh, city landscape awful constructions with idea that maybe somewhere, sometimes, something like that was there. And I am not speaking now about the uh, Riga as a very unique example, uh, the Black Hats uh, house reconstruction, or um, some other, but first of all about Poznan, where the awful uh, middle aged castle was built in the middle of the city uh, with hope that maybe 500 years ago something like that was there, but it's not true at all. And uh, please think about and let this text so hard as it is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, can I give the floor now? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I also would like to react to this uh, issue, and this is uh, actually the key issue for uh, protection of cultural uh, monuments. If we assume uh, to we as heritage. Uh, uh, savers, so to say, that the replicas uh, are acceptable uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, a monument uh, saving that we s then we s uh, show to the public that when we have a monument and we lose it, we will make it again, we will replicate. And actually this uh, would facilitate this destroying uh, of original values. But if we uh, express an opinion that when uh, replicating, uh, that uh, we express that we, when we uh, lose something, then it is lost forever, then we will fight for uh, restoration, for, for supporting and, and for heritage, so for these monuments, so we do not need to weaken this attitude. I think the sense of the meeting is that we keep the text as it was. Are you happy with that, Freddie? Sorry, just the word only insofar as that it doesn't allow that, that when it says original, um, I think the word original is am ambiguous. In other words, it may refer to the earliest phase of a building. And I feel if only is taken out, Original, I think it because original elements I, is better. I think we've agreed to take out the only, only in line two. Okay, that's and, fine. And this discussion has been about the last sentence, okay. which we keep. No, no, I'm it. happy that the only is taken out. Yeah. Sorry? I'm happy if only is taken out. In, in the second line? Yes. So it's talking about because original elements? Yes. Okay, right. Thank you very much. And there was somebody in the row behind you who wanted to make a comment. Um, it's only a small addition. It's on page one after bullet four. Um, each period of European history is marked out by its own architecture and design, responding to the social needs, and I would addition, to, um, and the circumstances, because we are not always able to meet our social needs. So we're responding to the social needs and circumstances of the time. The circumstances of the time, yeah. yeah okay. And it's, it's also uh, referring to the story of, um, sorry about the name, Ruta Matupelfela. She, she talked about the uh, liquidity of time. Yes. And um, so there's social need is um, something you can do yourself, but it's not always possible to react on the circumstances of the time and it's also an aspect of heritage. 
Yes. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Is everybody happy with that? Sorry? Right. So, yes, in responding to the circumstances and social needs. That are, thank you for that very helpful drafting point. But I also have another point. Yeah. Uh, back on the other page, uh, if I may, just to add two words. Uh, I didn't mention this before when I was asked because it wasn't there. It's now an amendment. Including for sustainable and quality tourism, I would like to add two words, for all. For all, mm -hmm. yes. yes. That's added. Yes. And uh, if I can come back to the, uh, as, as w the message that you want to send, it's really the, about the, the concept of replicas. I'm just wondering if this wording is acceptable, may be seen differently from what we mean. And so maybe we can see, uh, maybe taken into consideration only in exceptional circumstances. Because in the sense, if you, if you write it's acceptable, well, <coughs> somebody can say, okay, it is acceptable. I would have thought that but, uh, it was... if I'm interpreting well the, the willingness of this conference... I would have thought that the text was okay as it stood because it will be up to the proposers of each case for replication to demonstrate their circumstances are exceptional. Okay. And for the government, whatever the State Heritage Authority is, to judge whether those circumstances are exceptional. I, I really would prefer to leave that sentence as it is, I think. Um, because I think we need to keep it strong for all the reasons stated. Um, having done some study on reconstruction policies, I mean, firstly, it's a very sensitive area, and secondly, in the UK at least, what is said is not necessarily what is done. Um, so I think keep this as it is. Any other comments? Okay, then we have an agreed final statement. We will check it for grammar. Thank you all very much. So thanks, and now it's the turn of Mr. Uh, Juris Dambis, uh, the head of the State Inspection for Heritage Protection of Latvia, for the adoption of the statement. Cinemas ministers, dames and kung. Uh, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, in short, in our attitude, uh, we are uh, we have opened the door or just strengthened the bridge. Uh, uh, there is support for a bridge to have dialogue uh, among uh, cultural heritage design. Uh, of course, dialogue should be such that it is not just. Uh, 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 speaking around the bush and, uh, and uh, killing all the authenticities of uh, cultural monuments, but uh, uh, of course we have to find a place for respect towards cultural heritage, and also we have to extend uh, the uh, application of uh, uh, quality architecture and uh, in this generation. And uh, uh, the our statement. Uh, uh, shows and formulates understanding and the change of uh, uh, opinion and understanding. We are not insisting on absolute uh, truth, but we see also sense in uh, diff in variety. And I would think that uh, our, the essence of our statement uh, can be expressed in three uh, elements. So, so interdisciplinary uh, uh, cooperation, quality, and ethics. And the uh, inspectorate uh, will uh, be striving uh, to ensure that all, this, all the presentations, ideas, attitude, uh, and also everything what has been expressed in these premises uh, will be should be available on the Internet. And uh, I do hope that the uh, final statement will be used in the practical work in all European countries and the basic idea will be continued and developed also through new discussions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, colleagues from uh, other countries and also the uh, Minister of the Ministry of Culture. I would like to thank presenters, uh, speakers, uh, uh, my team from Inspector who are working hard during these days, and I would like to thank all of you.
So I would like to, to, to add the, to the thanks. So I, I want to thank you for the wonderful organization and uh, you, you read the Dumbis with, and uh, all your colleagues and uh, that helped you to organize this conference. Uh, while the, the, the menu was challenging, was with, uh, in, in, when with a fusion, we can call it a fusion cuisine, but uh, the presidency succeeded in uh, blending ingredients coming from different cultures and in finding a, a balance, a harmonic balance uh, between authenticity, contemporary creation, and uh, so I would like to also to ask you uh, to, to, to express your appreciation with uh, an applause to the, to the presidency, and uh, to thank also the interpreters, and uh, to thank you for your active uh, participation, and also to tell you that I really enjoyed to, to moderate this session, to participate in these uh, two days. Now it is the time for the dessert. <laughs> so we, I, <laughs> uh, it is my pleasure, it's my honor and uh, pleasure to give the floor to uh, Minister Malgorzada Omina Loska, which is the Minister of Culture and National Heritage of the Republic of Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, I sometimes forget that I am a minister and my temperament of the scientists and the person who devoted half of her life for protection of monument uh, wins sometimes. Anyhow, it is for me a very good opportunity to express how important for us is that Latvia took on uh, its um, organization this conference and pre preparation for the statement. Um, because I have a feeling that many years in 70s and 80s, even in the 90s, uh, European Union, Union put not enough strong stress on the culture problematic. And uh, this change we noticed last few years is really very important and crucial for Europe because it is, of course, very uh, important that each country has own culture and can concentrate on own uh, problems and own uh, tasks in this case. But uh, we should use such tool like European Union to have also this common platform of uh, discussion, which happened already a few times in the last years, and which what happened now in Riga. Uh, I am extremely uh, um, happy that exactly this, this subject was chosen to, by Latvia colleagues for this conference because heritage is a common and unique problem of each country in Europe. Contemporary architecture, which we also have everybody, but the problem of interaction between the heritage and new architecture and the design is something which is not identically uh, um, um, focused in every country in Europe. And hearing your reports in the afternoon and having this background knowledge from for former conferences and meetings, I think that we should also stress this difference which, between the Middle East countries, which had this communist uh, past before they, them and, and with West Europe. Um, I am not ready to speak in the name of every Middle East European country because we had also different uh, experiences. But Poland, as you know, after the Second World War was very, uh, very desert because of the destroying of monuments, for, especially in Warsaw, but also in Gdańsk and many smaller cities. And these processes, we started after the war. Reconstruction of our old city was the crucial point in our cultural policy to get back lost heritage and to get back the certain points of our identity. Till today, our historians are pretty sure that without this great task we made after, between 45 and 55, that we know Polish nation as it is now till today. But then came the time when we uh, stopped the processes and started to modernize the country. Of course, 
it's clear for everybody that in communist system, ownership relations were different than in West Europe. Uh, uh, position of architects, offices, it was different. It, it's, uh, there are obvious things, I, I would not know to, to speak deeper, deeper about it. But in a certain moment, in the year 1970, because of the pure political reason, uh, our government decided to reconstruct royal custom in Warsaw. And it was a turning point in the European history of reconstruction because it was the first monument which was reconstructed not just after destruction, but 25 years after that. And never before, nobody tried to reconstruct the building which didn't exist so long. And we made it very, very profoundly. So we had a documentation, architectural, photographical, and so on, so on, so on. And even more, after this reconstruction, we made, as a Polish historians, architects, conservators, great scope to sell the subject to the whole Europe, to the whole world, to tell, look at us, we managed. It is the most famous monument of Poland, which we recovered after 25 years not having it. And one point more, in the year 78, when this building was even not ready, not fully reconstructed, was inscribed in the World UNESCO list together with the whole Warsaw Old List. So we really managed, but we opened the Pandora box. And this Pandora box, at the very beginning, was not so dangerous, but after 89, shows what it really means. Because political reason is also always the ground why people decide to reconstruct something which didn't exist. You need a lot of money and a great effort to do that. So, uh, each, almost each of East European country choose one object to reconstruct it because of the political reason. In Riga, it was black uh, uh, head house. In Vilnius, it was the lower castle in Vilnius. In Kiev, two great monasteries lost during the Stalin era. Uh, even Russia, after the change of political system, decided to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the Orthodox Church in Moscow, Spas uh, Church, uh, which was destroyed during the Stalin era. Uh, and we also observed the reconstruction of the Dresden, Dresden Dresden, Dresden uh, Church of, mm, mm, in English it would be. Oh. <laughs> and we observe everybody in Europe almost 25 years, the long Berlin discussion about the royal, royal uh, imperial castle in the middle of the city. So, but still we can tell nothing wrong happened because each of these reconstructions were needed by the society. But the next step is already very dangerous because this next step, which was not done in many East European countries, but was done in Poland. Uh, for example, we, re we reconstructed Jablonowski uh, uh, castle in the middle of Warsaw. It was already a step too far because we, the only reason why we decided to reconstruct further the buildings which were destroyed during the war was that we lost trust to contemporary architecture. And of course, it has its own reason. As I said, system, the very uh, uh, limited possibilities, creation possibilities of architects living in this communist system. Uh, and the quality, in, in final, is that the quality of this uh, uh, modern architect, architecture, what, which was um, you know, contestated by the society. But we came into the situation in the 90s, in Poland, that we lost trust that our architects can construct good architecture. It's better to reconstruct anything what was f formed there because it was old and probably it would be re remember us, the, 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 the past, than to rescue that in our wonderful city will come the modern architect and do something we don't know what and we will not be able to accept it. 
and what happened in, uh, in uh, last decade when we started to be the part of the European Union, we got money. First time after the Second World War, Poland was in another position because economically we get enormous support to build and to create new public institutions. And finally, we could tell our architects, we are not a private developer. You don't have to think only about school meter. Please, design for us very good architecture, because we need a good architecture. We spent 460 million euro in six years for European money, and the second part of it, so altogether almost billion million to build in the whole Poland new museums, libraries, theaters, opera houses, and philharmony. Each of them were constructed on the, started from the competition. We invited architects from whole Europe, and some of buildings were constructed by, by the foreign architects. For example, Malameki from Helsinki built our Jewish museum in Warsaw. The Austrian company built the concert hall in uh, Rosławice. The uh, Spanish company from Brussels built Philharmonic House in Szczecin. We constructed almost 80 great public buildings in our space. Absolutely modern, super modern architecture, mostly in the middle of the old cities. And it's changed our world because people started to believe that modern architecture can be beautiful, can be acceptable, and can be good composed together with all structure of the city. And uh, this meeting for me, it's probably the first international opportunity to tell how grateful our society is because of this great change in our relation to all the new architecture because it's not enough to discuss. We have also to do something. And in our country it happens. It really happens. It's also not true that we don't know what to do inside this building. <laughs> the opera house in Bielostok had six months after opening some financial problems because of the not wrong management. But Today is one of the most occupied buildings in the Middle East Europe. We have a gas there not only from Poland, but also from Belarus, and also from Lithuania, who crossed the border to come to the opera spectacle in Belarus. And we have a feeling that not only we get a new substance, architectural substance, which allows us to develop the many aspects of our culture, but we also get a grateful tool to tell our society, please believe, modern architecture is better than the old one, which is only reconstructed and is not authentic. Old architecture is something what we should preserve because of its authenticity, with hope that we will preserve as much as it is possible. With full knowledge that everybody who is in this room knows exactly, we are not able to uh, protect every building because no use, it's lost. So industrial architecture is still under very great danger, and we know that, and we have not enough money to rescue every old factory. But anyhow, if we understand the heritage, and I have a feeling that, that in Europe this, uh, this feeling is without any doubt accepted by every nation, and we got this trust and feeling that modern architecture has its own place in the middle of all the architecture town, then we have a chance for the future. And thank you very much because of this discussion. And thank you very much for this conference because it was the most important topic we could discuss this very year. Thank you very much. It is uh, the turn again. I'm honored to give the floor to the Minister 
of Culture of the Republic of uh, Latvia, Mrs. Uh, Dace Melbarde, for the final conclusion. The Minister of Culture uh, of Poland, Madame Omilanowska, uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, taking the privilege to, to, to address you in, in Latvian, I will continue in Latvian. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank you for these couple of uh, very creative uh, days that you have spent uh, with each other. And uh, it was very interesting for me to hear uh, from you uh, regarding your final conclusions. And uh, I'm truly happy to be the host, especially during the time when uh, Latvia is the presiding uh, country of the Council of the European Union. And uh, of course, this conference and the topics that it covers, I think, uh, fully complies with the three priorities of Latvian presidency, uh, namely uh, sustainability, growth, and inclusion. And uh, cultural heritage uh, and uh, our attitude towards it is, uh, is one of the preconditions for a sustainable uh, growth in Latvia and Europe. And each individual uh, has the right to live in a quality environment. But at the same time, of course, it's also a responsibility for us to maintain it and to enrich it. I would like to uh, thank you, uh, my colleague, the Minister of Culture of Poland, for attending uh, this uh, conference, because Poland has a vast experience in combining the historical with contemporary. Of course, these experiences also have been quite painful at certain times. And I know that uh, the Madam Minister uh, is emotionally, emotionally very deeply invested in ensuring protection of, these, of the cultural heritage. Therefore, I'm very happy to have her among us, us in uh, concluding these, um, uh, this uh, conference as we pre prepare to submit uh, these uh, findings and conclusions also to the Council. And I truly hope that uh, our proposals will be heard at the European level. Likewise, I'm uh, very grateful that the, the European Commission has supported the organizing of this conference. And once again, I would like to emphasize how important it was, it was for us to have Tibor Navracic to open uh, this conference. Because, as I said before, the outcomes of this conference will be presented to the Council of the Ministers for Culture. And of course, the presence of a comm commissioner uh, is a sign of continuity for this work also in the future. And uh, generally speaking, this week has been very creative and busy. Not only we are concluding this conference, but we are also concluding the uh, Creative Week, Go Create. And uh, this week has been, we have been organizing this week already for five years. And uh, thusly, we try to strengthen um, uh, creativity as such, as well as strengthen ties between different industries and politi politicians as well. And here, uh, when we talk about uh, creative placemaking, uh, uh, has been the underlying principle for our work whenever we organize this uh, week dedicated to creativity. And I'm convinced that uh, the issues uh, related to creativity will be discussed also in the future. 
And I would also like to say that I am very satisfied in the context of our presidency and this week uh, regarding uh, the uh, Latvian design and its strengthening of its positions at European scale. And uh, here probably I should talk about the contemporary design uh, exposition, uh, which uh, uh, inspires us with a variety of manifestations of design. And uh, we can see a very many positive uh, examples of how uh, the historical and contemporary create synergies. And architecture and design is the art of creating a, a living environment uh, which is in harmony with us. And uh, Gunnar Berkert uh, uh, also has mentioned that, that uh, this, our surroundings leave a huge impact on how we feel. And also, of course, uh, it helps us uh, to ensure the necessary functionality and um, such a quality environment also uh, creates the feeling of belonging and feeling of home. And therefore, I would like to thank uh, the rector of uh, the Latvian Academy of Art about talking about uh, this farmstead, uh, the father's house, about the feeling of belonging, because uh, this concept has very deep roots in the Latvian mentality and identity. And whenever we search for ourselves, we may end up, end up at our homes, or at least the place where we feel like at home, and therefore it is important for us to remember about all these aspects, especially when we talk about uh, uh, cultural um, heritage and its synergy with contemporary architecture. We always should remember that uh, they all serve people. They should be focused on individuals, and uh, therefore I was ha very happy to hear about this emphasis on human individuals uh, in the conclusion of your um, uh, conference, because as a minister, I have quite frequently uh, been in situations where behind grandiose ideas, uh, we sometimes um, forget about the needs of individuals, the needs of society, how they feel, and what do they expect. And uh, therefore, when we talk about uh, our surroundings, we should not only talk about physical comfort, but also how it educates, how it uh, inspires, how it, uh, how it uh, enriches our society. And uh, therefore, I would also uh, like to uh, express my appreciation of another aspect of your conclusions which is also very important for me personally, namely the, uh, the intangible uh, dimension of cultural uh, heritage. Because, of course, cultural heritage is multifaceted and uh, we shouldn't forget or neglect also intangible part of it. Uh, of, of course, the, the tangible part can be more easily defined. At the same time, uh, intangible cannot be always identified or defined. Nevertheless, it is equally important for us. And uh, therefore, I would like to call on you as professionals to continue uh, your uh, research in the area of uh, intangible cultural heritage as we form our cultural space across the Europe and also here in Latvia, of course. And I think that uh, the newly built uh, National uh, Library of Latvia is a good example um, since it also is a main building which hosts the events under the Latvian presidency. It acts as a symbolic uh, intangible heritage 
which is combined with high quality architecture. Of course, uh, it is uh, based on our legends, on our folklore, on our literature, and our music. Initially, it was uh, the, the poem uh, by Rhinis about the glass mountain to be conquered. And uh, in a way, we have materialized uh, symbols that have been so dear to our nation throughout years into this building of uh, uh, of a library and also the uh, this library is often called among Latvians uh, the palace of light and uh, there is also a very popular song composed by a Latvian composer uh, named after this uh, palace of light and uh, of course uh, the symbol symbolizes uh, our our self awareness and uh, our uh, freedom and now that it has uh, been matter materialized uh, as our library uh, as a result of uh, design by Gunnar Spirkert uh, we can see that uh, not only it makes references to Latvian past, but also plays with modern and contemporary elements. And this clearly shows that uh, if managed smartly and responsibly, we can make these bridges between the past and the future, while also make, me, creating synergies between the, the tangible and intangible values. Ladies and gentlemen, you have worked very hard during these two days, which resulted in your joint statement. And once again, I would like to call on you uh, to promote uh, the involvement of general public in discussing various projects. Let us not forget about uh, the details because we have to appreciate also the small things. And uh, therefore, I would like to mention a project uh, named uh, Student, uh, Researcher, and City Dweller, uh, which was aimed at creating uh, an uh, well-balanced surroundings based on well-informed society because only um, appropriate understanding uh, and knowledge can create uh, a demand for such surroundings. And when we have uh, a demand for high quality surroundings, we will be able also to offer them such surroundings. Of course, on one hand, we should always remember about our past. On the other hand, we always have to come up with new solutions. And uh, 2018 will be a very special year for Latvia and also many other Central and Eastern European countries who will that, that will celebrate uh, their 100th uh, anniversary. And uh, that was uh, it was 100 uh, years ago when the modern uh, Europe emerged. And in a way, it was the time when uh, the identity of Europe was created uh, and its motto, uh, unity in diversity. And therefore, I fully support the initiative of uh, the German Minister of Culture to announce the year 2018 as the year of European heritage. And I truly hope that we will receive support from our colleagues during the Council of the Ministers of, Cu of Culture and we will be able to once again meet in 2018 in several uh, types of uh, events. And in the very conclusion, I would like to express my support uh, toward your very strict stance uh, towards uh, the uh, value of authentic authenticity and uh, Thanks once again to the Minister of Culture of Poland for contributing to this uh, discussion because this is uh, especially topical 
given the situation in northern Iraq where the so-called ISIS uh, terrorist groups have been destroying more than two uh, several uh, sculptures uh, and manuscripts uh, that are older than 2000 years so i wouldn't like to finalize this uh, this uh, uh, conference on such a sad note however i would like to uh, wish you all the success in your future uh, work so once again thanks a lot for your contribution and also in uh, contributing to the final remarks of the conference. Thank you.